you know, the, uh, the riches and the inheritance that you've been given as a, a child of God. <coughs> They're not a treasure chest you can get on your way out the door. It's not gold. It's not silver. It's not physical currency. And Paul said, let us set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Those things that are of the earth are temporary, but those things that are in heaven are eternal. If you go by your sight right now, you might think you're wise. There's a way that seems good to a man, but the end thereof is death. But if you go by the word of God, the treasure you two put together for yourself will never be taken away. And the treasure that no man can take from you, that only God can give you. you know, stuff. You know, in 20 years, the stuff you like now won't be the stuff you like then. It's just going to rot. <laughs> so so what's, what is the things that you can take with you? It's, it's the things that only God can give you. It's his love. And it's not just, oh, how good God is. Do you know he made you his child? He gave you his love, his joy, his peace. See, if these things abound in you, you won't fail. If you have, if they abound in you, everybody say, if they abound, if they abound. in me, in you're not going to fail. I'm, I'm not going to fail. See, because nobody can take that from you. They could put Paul in prison. They could shackle him in, in the worst dungeon in the sewers. And he'll write, count it all joy. Why? Because they can't do anything to take away what God gave to them. Because what God has for you is eternal. Do you know more than what you have right now? Peace. Everybody say peace. Peace, peace can abound in you. It can abound in you. Well, you. You may say, I'm at peace. Well, I bet you he's got more. You think you're at peace until he takes something out that you didn't know was there. Anybody ever had a pain they've had so long that they've forgotten? You know, they're just used to it. My wife had that with her back, and she had lower back pain for years, and it was such a common part of her. She never complained about it at all. It was just always kind of there. When she did complain about it was when we had our two children. <laughs> Marshall and Joshua, okay? Rightly so, eh? amen? <laughs> All right. Well, happy to say God healed her. She doesn't have that anymore. He, this is the same today, yesterday, forever. What you see Jesus doing is what he would do here today. It's, it's, not, it's the same gospel. It's not, a, it's not multiple gospels. It's not edited gospels. You didn't get the revised version of the gospel. There's only one. And it's the king that Jesus said, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. If it was at hand then, before the new birth, before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how much more is it at hand now? See, because he was the only representative of the power of God on this planet. But his intention wasn't that it stop with him. His intention was that every single one of my disciples would go and do what I'm doing. So how much more is the kingdom of God at hand? It's not only at hand in Jerusalem, one city. It's supposed to be at hand here in Iowa. It's supposed to be at hand in Mexico. It's supposed to be at hand in every continent on the planet, every nation on the planet. It's supposed to be at hand. And that's what we're pressing towards, amen? And I, I see, Paul said, I press toward the mark, right? It is a process to let these things abound in you. Don't you think Jesus was at peace? See, why, why we, we, sometimes we oversimplify who Jesus was. Jesus had all of, not only did he have all of the power of God manifested through him, it wasn't him that did it, it was through him by his father. He says, if the works that I do, it's my father that does them. That's what he said. See. But he had, don't you think, not only did he have the power, don't you think he had the nature that God gave him? Don't you think peace abounded in him everywhere he went? Don't you think joy abounded in him everywhere he went? What about love? See, can God work without those things? 
He does with the gifts sporadically through just sheer obedience. But see, what Jesus was was more than just sporadic gifts of obedience. He represented the nature of God everywhere he went. Love abounded in him everywhere he went. Peace abounded in him everywhere he went. And it can abound in you. It can abound more and more and more until it just takes you over. It takes over the way you think. It takes over how you treat people. It takes over how you act. When you're approached with a situation, you don't think about that situation the way you used to. See, see look at the disciples. You, when they got in that boat, do you remember? And I don't doubt that most of us maybe would respond the same way. I'd like to think I'd have faith. But see, what you'd like to have and what you actually have usually gets tested at that time, right? <laughs> it's one thing to uh, say it's, a, it's one thing to say things. It's another thing to walk them out, right? And Peter, I, Peter said, he said, uh, I'd die for you. I'd die for you, Jesus. Did he? Spirit is willing. Flesh is weak. Okay. See, the, the fo- if you follow the Holy Ghost... He'll take the flesh out of the way and your spirit will have free reign to do what God's called you to do. Every step into God is a step out of your flesh. The idea being, say, look, if if you can trace back and see that you've been walking the same way for 20 years, don't cry about it. Just change it. Just change it. And what I mean by that is you start seeking God as much as you can. Now, I'm at, you know, it's been a progressive walk. What I step off in prayer now isn't what I used to step off in prayer. It's easier for me now to stop and listen for him than it used to be. Praise God. (coughs) These things are supposed to bound in us that we can have his mindset in these situations. See, because we want to see the power of God manifested in our lives. We want to be able to pray for people and see him get healed. Everybody on board with that. I'm not, in, I'm not interested in a dead religion. That's not what this is. This is the relationship with the only one that made you, gave you his life, redeemed you after you were gone, and, and gave you his Holy Spirit so you could redeem everybody else. It's a living, breathing thing. It's, it's not a religion. Religion is man's attempt to, to, to create or to justify the way they live and try and do penance for the things they do wrong. My son, as much as he want to be, say, a Peters, he cannot work into your family because he wasn't born a Peters, period. Everybody with me? So try as you might, the only way in is through the birth, the new birth. And that comes through only one way, and that is Jesus Christ, the one that was sent. He is the, in the same way that the first Adam was the birth of all, the new Adam was the second birth of everyone. That receives him. See. And you've got that life on the inside of you. And it can be grown up. Peace can abound in you. And so you can see. You can see. It wasn't just. It was a mentality. It was a heart condition. That Jesus walked around in a different state of reality. Than his disciples did. See, When his disciples faced that storm. They were doing everything they knew to do. Fearful for their lives. This is the way men operate, men and women operate. We're going to bail the water, bail the water. And and, and they see him walking on the water, okay? And he says, or no, no, I'm I'm on the wrong one. I I merged two stories. He was sleeping in the boat. Everybody with me? Sleeping in the boat. And he wakes up to find a storm. He wakes up to find a boat half sunk. And you know what his response is? Why are you fearful? You little faith. And he speaks to the wind and the waves. Now, I guarantee you the peace was on him, in him, before it was ever peaceful outside. And if he was speaking out of fear and speaking out of a, 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 a fretful state, what kind of faith is that in God? God, please save us. I'm sure they were saying that. See, but there was peace in him, in, you know, 
you know, he spoke to those winds and waves and they calmed. There was calm on the inside of him and God through the power of the Holy Ghost manifested what was already working in him. See, it's one thing to know God's will. It's one thing to uh, aspire to it. But see, only time with him can cultivate and develop the peace to walk into situations and not be, not be the same. To be able to take things on you've never taken on before. I know that I've had more, I've walked in more peace. I know the things I used to be afraid about, I'm not afraid of. Because what he's doing on the inside of me, the further you go into him, the more he enlarges those areas and it overtakes you. And the idea, the idea is that it wouldn't just be a benefit to you. It's not like you're an island and you're just waiting to get out of here. I, to be honest, I really am annoyed at those songs that you hear on TV about and, and, and the people that are always talking about leaving. Look, if God wanted to take you, he could have done that. That's not why we're here. We're not here to wait. We're here to occupy. We're here to redeem the time. We're here to spread the good news of the gospel. Why does everybody need good news? Because all that there was before was bad. See. Every step into the spirit is a step out of the flesh. And the more that I understand the nature of the flesh, everybody say flesh. flesh. See, it's the flesh that keeps us from operating in more of what God has for us. Let's go to... Hmm. Be opening your Bibles. Hmm. Yes, this is a good one. Let's go to First Corinthians, Chapter Nine. Verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Everybody say temperate. Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. <coughs> so let me, this is a, a parable, all right? In a way, it's a small parable. It's an example of a physical situation or a physical example of a spiritual principle. And what he's doing is he's using an athlete here. The Olympic Games, they had those back then too, I guess, all right? They have the uh, 2018 Winter Olympics, I guess, coming up. Well, you take one of those athletes. What does their schedule look like? And just think about it. You just think about it. What does their schedule look like? Do you think they binge watch Netflix three hours a day? Do you think... Uh, they have a lot of free time to socialize. Do you think they're on Facebook posting every hour and a half? I doubt it. Okay. What is their uh, what's their diet look like? Do you think that they now? Granted, they might be able to eat a little bit more because they're so active. <laughs> Well, what, are they, what, what kind of stuff do they eat? Lots of protein. They have a regimented diet, don't they? They want to keep that body fat lean. They want to keep that muscle mass high. They don't want extra weight. Extra weight slows you down. 
They have to be a lean, mean fighting machine to do whatever it is their, their, their vision is on that thing. Okay? When I was in track, you, there was a guy that I, I, I admired. He, he was a younger guy. He put everything into this. And he was skinny as a rail, but, man, he could run a mile in under five minutes. It was, he was just awesome. He was one of the best, best long-distance runners we had. And um, he ate salads. He was disciplined. He went to state. All right? Now, you know, the guys that are chowing down on pizza and, and, and uh, <laughs> French fries, and they come to, come to practice every other day, or they don't come on time, or they're not running on their own. This guy would train like two months, three months before track would start. So if you want to go to state, that's what you do. You, you know, that's the price you pay. I always saw him running around. See, and Paul is saying this. He's saying, look, know you not that they which run in a race run all. Everybody's, everybody runs, but only one wins. And then you might have some genetics. But how many of you know you can't run on genetics? It's hard work. Michael Phelps would have never been Michael Phelps if he had not trained as much as he did. Now, there might be some natural gifted ability, but I've met kids that had tremendous natural gifted ability, and they squandered it. There was a guy we had in school that he was a tremendous running back. If he would have applied himself even 50% of what I did, <laughs> he, would have, he would have undoubtedly gone to college, played college ball. Maybe, I don't know. He was just amazing. He was so fast. But he, but he threw it away on drinking, got in a car accident, messed him up, he's done. He's in the wheelchair for the rest of his life. He's done. But the ability, see. See, what did you get? What did you get when you got born again? And how do you steward it? See, when Jesus was praying in John chapter 14 through 17, and he was saying, the glory that I had, or the glory that I have, I give it to them. Do you remember that? Sometimes I'll quote that verse and nobody believes me. Look, well, maybe we'll go to that. But do you remember that? The glory that I have, I give it to them. All right, let's go there. Let's go to John, the Gospel of John. Give me a second to find it here. There it is. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Y'all use verses I'm not using. I didn't have this verse, so. Go to Ch John chapter 17. Hmm. Oh, yeah, this is all good. I'm just, this is, this is my sermon in a nutshell already. We'll start in verse 18. Ah, uh, 16, 16. I won't look back anymore because I'll just read the whole thing. So, John chapter 17, verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If you want a good confession, this whole thing would be a really good confession for you to start believing this is true. I'm not of the world just like Jesus wasn't of the world. Lord, wouldn't that change your mind? They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That is Jesus' definition of what the truth is. It's God's word. As thou hast sent me into the world, well, look at this, even so have I also sent them. Well, how was Jesus sent? To declare the kingdom of God. And that's what you're called to do too in the same way. As I was sent, I'm sending them. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified through the truth. The sanctification that he's talking about here is about what he's about ready to do. He's about ready to go to the cross for you. He was being, he had to learn this obedience, Hebrews says, for our sakes. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone. Okay, that was the 12 or 11 at that time. Judas, Judas was gone. The 11 that were there, that they 
neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Everybody raise your hand. That's me. Say, that's me. That's me. See? That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. Now, the oneness he's talking about there is that there would be a relationship between them and the Father in the same way that people could look at Jesus and see the unity between Jesus and God and say, we know that God is with you. There was a, there was a unity between them. Every time you saw Jesus, you knew God was there because of everything he did. And he's saying, I pray that same unity would be for all of you. That's what he's saying. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, in this way, art in me and I in thee, that they also may believe they, they may be one in us. To what end? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Man, that's so strong. That's so strong in me. The vision in this, it's not just church and buildings. It's just not a club about who Jesus used to be. The idea is why where, everywhere Jesus went, he raised the dead, he healed the sick. It says he healed them all and everybody around him knew God was with him and that God was there to save them. And his whole idea is that I want that to be spread through every single one of you that the whole world would know and believe that God has sent me. That's the whole plan. The plan isn't to shut up doors and wait until heaven. The plan isn't to just talk about things. The plan isn't to sit in discipleship groups year after year after year until you go home to heaven. The plan is to become like him so you can do what he did and accomplish this goal. Let's get this job done because I want to go to heaven. I want to go to the new the new heavens and the new earth. I want to see what the new one looks like. This is good enough. I want to see what the new one looks like. He's, he's not only waiting for us, he's also waiting for us to get that job. If the job was done, he'd come. That's the bottom line. If it was done, he'd come. If everybody had made up their minds already, he'd come. But see, people don't see the truth, and so they can't make up their minds. They don't know God is out there because they don't see the truth in us. They saw it in Jesus. But when they see it in us, there's going to, I'm telling you, there's going to be such a dividing line in this earth. It is going to be made so plain what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, is what is God and what is not. And it's going to be so clear that the power of God will be so explicitly obvious in every corner of, the per of this world that people will have to choose. They will have to say, now this decision is before me. What is this? And when that decision breaks in every single heart on this planet, he's going to come back. That's what he's waiting for. How many people don't know because they haven't seen? He's waiting for people to see. He's been waiting for people to see. This is the vision of Jesus. Look at this. That, the, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And here's where I was going. And the glory. Everybody say glory. glory. <laughs> and the glory which thou gave me, I have given them. That they may be one even as we are one. Who's he talking to? He's talking to God. And he's saying, the glory that I have, I'm giving it to them, that they, everybody say me, me, may be one with the Father in the same way that Jesus was one with the Father. Now, I double-dog dare you to go into most churches and tell them, I've got the same glory as Christ, and I'm one with the Father like Christ. Most of them will kick you out. All right. That's just because they don't read this. You know what real humility is? It's agreeing with God. If you want to acknowledge something else, it's pride. You want to say, I'm not worthy? That's false humility. You're in pride. Because he said, everybody said, he said. Jesus said, I'm not going to contradict Jesus. You can if you want. I'm not going to. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Well, what does that glory look like? 
See, when somebody got born with natural ability, when we were talking about Phelps or, you know, some of the kids I knew in high school, how did they steward that? One of them had the gift, and it was so obvious. But the way he stewarded it was Friday night, you know, drunk with his friends, getting in the car, drugs. That's how he stewarded his first birth. And he had ability, but he stewarded it poorly. And the other guy, he stewarded it, and he, he's, he, was a, he went on to run track in college. You know, he was a tremendous athlete. See, this is what Paul was saying. Everybody runs, but one re- only one receives the prize. Now, he's not saying, Paul is not saying, look, all of us, all of us on this planet, we're in a big competition. Whoever's going to, you know, what is it? I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. You know, the, the more you witness to, the better you get in line. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself when they come to my door, well, if this is true, I'm way behind you guys. <laughs> I'm way behind. Anyway, that's not what he's saying here. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, look, you have been given a new life in Christ, and you have a calling that has been given to you. And it is your job to run the race, to finish strong, to fill out the call. And that's what Paul, at the end of his life, with full conscience, he was able to say, I ran my race. I finished my course. I'm ready to go. That is what my testimony is going to be. Now, I can say that, but then you have to go walk it out. Everybody say, walk it out. See, all right, let's go back. Everybody enjoy that. I'm so glad I went to John. That's so much better than what I had planned. <laughs> go to, uh, <laughs> go back to uh, 1 Corinthians. That's where we were, right? That's so neat when he does stuff like that. Because I, I, had, I had the prompt once. I thought, oh, no, they know that, Alfred. And, uh, and I had it again. Blessed me. Blessed me, if not anybody else. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 9. And this is what he's saying. Know ye not, verse 24, that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you might obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. They steward their time wisely. They don't. They don't focus on other things. They don't got time to read a bunch of frivolous books. I'm not saying books are frivolous. You know what I'm saying, you know. They don't got time to watch a bunch of shows. They, they're, they're laser focused on one thing, and that is accomplishing or winning that race that they're going to be in. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He says, but we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. See? (coughs) Okay. I have to read this all and it'll come clear. But I keep under my body, and and that's just King James changing around the sentence a little bit. He's saying I keep my body under. I keep my body under. Okay? I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. All right. Now look at this. He's saying, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so fight, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. What does that mean? All right. I understand enough to know that you can't be, if you're going to accomplish something great or if you're going to win a race, you have to be focused right? So an unfocused person, people that won't win races, regardless of how good they are, if they're not completely focused on that one thing, let's say they, you know, like a laser. I'm I'm kind of techie like that. You know lasers? If you can concentrate a bunch of light into one, you know, like if you ever fried ants on the sidewalk in the summer, okay? I give a bunch. (laughs) If you ever do that, that's because the magnifying glass points all that light into one place And if you get it right down to the right place, I always felt bad after I did it. I could only do one. (laughs) I was just, I'm a softie, okay? And 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 I (laughs) But see, you gotta get it you gotta get all of it concentrated right there and it'll it'll catch flame. See. 
And your life can be like that. And people, people use their life for that to, to chase after ambition. They become prominent in the business world. They become prominent in the athletic world. They become prominent in all kinds of different spheres of, of, uh, of culture and things like that because they focus on that one goal and they achieve it. It has nothing to do with God. They might have talent, but that has nothing to do with God. All right? That's just the application of their will in one single direction. And Paul is saying, why don't you do that with the gospel so that we can run like Christ, friend? See, why don't we get that focus? Because people that don't win races, they'll put, they might put a good amount. Let's, let's say a, a, a world-class athlete. Let's do this example. Let's say they give 70% of all of their resources, their time, their stewardship towards accomplishing that goal. 70% is a lot. I did pretty good. Are they going to beat the guy that gave everything? Probably not. Not when fractions of a second matter. Not when the tiniest little difference. <laughs> I had a guy, he would, this is too extreme for me, he would shave his legs running track so that he wouldn't get any wind resistance on the hair. And I'm thinking, you're not going to see any difference on that, buddy. <laughs> you know, what do you think you are? You think you're <laughs> John Johnson or something? I don't know. <laughs> you, you, okay. But for see, that's how much you, you, know, you care. Every little detail. Focus. See? And that's the kind of stewardship he's saying. I don't run uncertainly. I run on purpose. I am, I am on purpose with this thing. So far, I not as one that beateth the air. Well, how do you beat the air? Maybe that's, that's what we just described as one way. You're fighting something that's not there. You're doing something you're not supposed to be. But look at this. This is what he, he continues on. How do you beat the air? Okay. He says, but I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Well, how would you beat the air? I do not, I do not keep my body in check, and I don't bring it into subjection to me. That is a good way of beating the air. That is a good way of running uncertainly. See, because you can follow God as much as you want, but if your flesh is running 20, 40, 50, 60% of your life, you're going to be beating the air 20, 40, 60% of your life. I don't like the idea of beating the air at all. And see, God doesn't either. He's, this is bigger. Everybody say bigger. This is bigger than going to heaven. We're not talking about just getting born again and getting out of here. If that's the train you want, <laughs> that's fine. We're talking about discipleship. And Jesus said, if, he's, if anybody's going to come after me and be my disciple, he has to daily, daily pick up his cross and follow me. See, Every day, what does that look like for somebody that does tr track or an athletic or on a world stage in the Olympics? Well, they, they ran 20 miles yesterday. Well, you get up and you do it again. You get up and you do it again. You get up and you do it again. You get up and you do it again until you have focused everything you have to accomplish what you were supposed to accomplish. Now, he's using all of that as an example to say, to say, look, I don't fight uncertainly. I fight with certainty and I keep my body under. Now, this is a real good place to interject the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And Paul understood that. That's why he says this. He says, if I don't keep my body under, if I don't keep my flesh under, it has the capacity to make me a castaway. Didn't he say that? And that castaway word, it's the same word as reprobate. Reprobate. When it says you know, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were unseemly. He says the flesh has that capacity. The flesh has nothing in common with God. And everybody's got one. Unless there's somebody here that I can't see. <laughs> we're going to cast you out if you're <laughs> Anyway. No spirits in here. We're not going to have it. Not <laughs> Your time's over. <laughs> See, everybody's got a flesh. And it's your job to keep it under. How do, how do you keep it under? How do you keep it under? <coughs> 
Well, Jesus said this. He says, when I'm gone in those days, then shall they fast. And one of the ways you keep your body under is fasting. It's fasting. It wasn't, um, it wasn't if you want to. He says, if you, in those days you shall fast. He said, when you pray, when you give, when you fast, if you want to. No, when you fast. See? And this is, we're talking about discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. I keep my body under and bring it unto subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The devil loves to do that. Loves to do that. He loves to take people that have done wonderful things for God. He loves to take people that have accomplished and done great works and miracles even. And while they're up on a pedestal, take them down because their flesh wasn't kept under. News always covers those people. Very faithfully, they cover them. Okay, you won't you won't get any coverage of solid people. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> let's see if there's anything else he wants to say here. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, why don't we go to First Peter? First Peter chapter four, and I think this will be the last one. I will shoot myself in the foot when I say that, though. <laughs> First Peter chapter four. Start here in verse one. For as much then. I'll let everybody get there, I'm sorry. It's near the end. A <laughs> couple of books before Revelation. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Everybody say same. Same mind. Now look at this. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased. Everybody say ceased. Ceased from sin. For as much then as Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. I have a question for you. When did Christ suffer in the flesh? On the cross? Yes. That was probably the greatest expression that was the greatest expression of obedience. <clears throat> you know, it says in Scripture that he did not. He was not made to go there. You know that? He could have said one word to Pilate. He could have said one word to the Jews. He could have said one word, period. And it would have been over. He would have been out of it. You got that kind of ability. He kept his mouth closed during every single trial he had. He kept his mouth closed. Now, what would possess somebody to keep their mouth closed and walk that out? Because he's a man like you and me. He's a, he's a person. He has the same flesh. He had the same emotions. He had the same thought running through his head. And, and moreover, he knew what was coming. Now, what's got to be on the inside of him to go through with that and keep his mouth closed? I guarantee you, I guarantee you, it was there before he got to the cross. I guarantee you he was walking in submission and obedience every single day of his ministry. And when he said, pick up your cross and follow me every day, he was living every day like he was going to die. He was living without thought. He was setting his affections on things above. And it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Where's the joy? Look at this situation. You ever seen the passion of the Christ? Where's the joy? You see joy? That's because you see it with here. It was in here. Where's the peace? It's the things that you can't take away. 
and he had them in abundance to the degree that he was willing to endure the cross to be obedient to his father to accomplish your and my salvation. That was what was on the inside of him. And it was working on the inside of him every day he ministered. See, So not only did he express that on the day of, his, of the cross, he suffered in the flesh every single day in the sense that he was living out without his own affections, without his own will, without his own plan. He was living for him. One of the things the Holy Ghost would ask me, he says, do you think Jesus liked carpentry? You think he was good at it? And he asked me this to put it in perspective. See, there was something else that was bigger that he was willing to lay down dreams for. I have no idea. But I ask, he asks me that. Maybe he was very good at it. Maybe he had tremendous skill at carpentry. It wasn't important to him. It was more important to do what God told him to do. See, and usually the way we run our race is we try and follow the things we like to do and ask God to come along and plan it for us. He'll walk with you where you are. That's all I can say. But that doesn't mean you accomplished what he wanted. It's there for everybody what he wanted. <coughs> he suffered for us in the flesh. Now look, Peter's, Peter's admonition. He says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. In other words, that same state of mind he had every day, you have that same state of mind every day. Arm yourselves likewise with that same mind. And what is the end result with that? Well, I can't ever be free from sin. He has suffered in the flesh, is freed from sin. In other words, if you put your body under, you can have dominion over it. And what R Paul said in Romans, he says, sin shall not, everybody say not, have dominion over you. Sin is the expression of your flesh saying, I'm going to do what I want, and I don't care what your spirit wants. That's what sin does. When you sin, it's the flesh saying, this is my time. I get to do what I want, and I'm in charge. And your flesh sits back there and cowers while it's been made in the righteousness of God and true holiness, and it's got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of saying, we can take this thing on and get it out of here. But see, if you've suffered in the flesh, what does that mean? You've made that flesh say, no, I'm going to submit you to me, and you're not going to have dominion over me anymore. That flesh has got to suffer. Does everybody see what he's saying? He that suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live. See, we're not talking about just a... You've been made the righteousness of God, and people will say, well, I'm made the righteousness of God, so I can do whatever I want because I'm made the righteousness of God. That is hogwash. You're made the righteousness of God to live the righteousness of God. You're not made the righteousness of God to live however you want. He didn't pay for that. Spit in Jesus' face if you do that. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live. Everybody say live. Live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to what? But to the will of God. To the will of God. <clears throat> That's how we run our race. That's how we obtain the prize. See, this is, this is a discipleship message. Okay, this is more than just information. This is more than just knowledge about the word. This is more than just going to heaven. This is fuel to run on. And you can take it as far as you want. Paul ran with it a long ways. And we get to read everything Paul said and see everything Paul did and all the mighty works that he accomplished. But he had the same life that you started out with. He stewarded it. He, he ran like an athlete with the Spirit of God on the inside of him. And he focused everything on that call. That's what I'm running towards. Anybody, go, anybody, anybody with me? Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, Father God, I think that's good. Father God, I'm so grateful. Thank you for that you brought your mind today. Thank you for blessing me with your understanding. Thank you for helping me with the message. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And Father, I thank you. I don't believe it's any coincidence that this message accompanied that grace from the beginning. I thank you for people not only to have the knowledge of how to do this, but I thank you for that grace, that grace that was at the beginning to take what they understand and run with it and apply it and to take ground from the enemy that the spirit 
not the enemy, take ground from their flesh, take ground from their flesh. I thank you for the spirit to rise up on the inside of them, that they would overcome those things that have kept them at bay and kept them out of rooms of fellowship with you and that they would accomplish more and more in their life and more and more in this year. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. You are dismissed.